a teacher of the word, church of God, with a standing ovation unto Jesus and giving honor to him. Anna is due. You want to receive the administration of Reverend Dr. George Wilfred Atta. Thank you. Hallelujah. Can you lift your hand on high? Lift your both hands and just begin to bless God. Thank you, Holy Spirit of God. Thank you, Holy Spirit of God. Thank you, sweet Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Glory to Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit of God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Thank you, Holy Spirit. May you have your way as you implant the seed of your word into our hearts that it may grow, germinate, and bear seed and fruit. To you be glory now and forevermore. In Jesus' name, the Son of God. Can you please be seated? Can you please be seated? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. I want you to welcome your neighbor. Welcome your neighbor. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Ask your friend, why are we here? And give an answer. What answer did you give? My heart desires that your heart will be inflamed with passion. Can I hear a big amen? amen. Your heart will be aflamed with passion. Passion. Pastor Michael, Lisa, can you give us a wave of friend? Hallelujah. Two weeks ago, Someone I know or someone I knew died. The person died. And I knew the person for at least a number of years. And as he died, when the information got to me, I was sitting down in my room and I was just thinking where the person was going contemplating whether the person was going to heaven or hell. The person was going to church. All right. But as to whether the person was born again, I didn't know. But the person was a church leader. But as to whether the person was born again, I knew not. So, I was just thinking about this person. Is he in hell or in heaven? Can you hear me clearly? As I was thinking, all of a sudden, the Holy Ghost said, I was, I was just thinking, just contemplating. Then all of a sudden, the Holy Ghost said, Luke 16, 23. 
Then I knew the person was in hell. <laughs> because in hell, he lift up his eyes, being in torment, and see Abraham and Lazarus in his bosom. Praise God. Hallelujah. And I knew the man was in hell. The man was in hell. Because that scripture spoke of um, the rich man and Lazarus. Praise God. Tell your neighbor hell is a reality. And tell him heaven is a reality. Death. I know you are, you are not thinking of death yet because you, we are all young people. But all you know, your great grand, your grandfather will be thinking of death. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Death. How many of you have thought of dying? At least committing suicide. Death. When I was a convert and I found the scripture, when I found Ecclesiastes 9.5, I was, I was amazed that the living know that they shall die, but the dead know not anything. Neither have they any more a reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. Death. The living know that they shall die. The living know that they shall die. Psalm 116 verse 15 said that precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his sins. Hmm. To some people, death is pleasant, but to some others, death is very unpleasant. In the days of John Wesley, there was a man by name Tom Paine, an atheist who wrote a book entitled The Age of Reason and led many away from God. On his deathbed, he was about dying, then he screamed and said, Oh, if I had a world, I'd have given that the age of reason should not have been written. Then he was in pain, and he, then he said, God, why are you tormenting me? Then he came to himself and said, Ah, is there a God at all? Then the woman who was attending to, the nurse who was attending to him, was going away. Then she, he screamed, don't go, don't go, don't go. Please don't go. It is hell to be left alone. Then he said, my God, my God, why has thou forsaken me? When John Wesley was dying, he was smiling. He said, the best of all is that God is with us. Then he said, farewell, farewell. The best of all is that God is with us. <laughs> when Voltaire was dying, when he was alive, he said, he prophesied to himself and said, in 20 years, Christianity shall be no more. My single hand shall destroy the edifice of which it took 12 apostles to rear. He was boasting. The place where he was and made this prophecy is a place at the, at the present called the Geneva Bible Institute. And this man on his deathbed, hmm. but one man was, so when people are dying, have you witnessed an infidel dying before? Someone was very wicked on his deathbed. It's very miserable. I remember one, one of the great Caesars of the Roman Empire. He fought Christianity and fought against Jesus and killed thousands of people and millions of people. On his deathbed, he thought he could extinguish Christianity and destroy Christianity. In his days, he said no Christian should live. He did his best to destroy Christianity. But the more he killed them, the more Christianity grew and multiplied. The more he was doing, the more Christianity was growing. Then on his deathbed, he lifted up his hands to the sky and said, Nazarene, thou hast conquered. 
Nazarene. Say Nazarene. Nazarene. Thou hast conquered. Jesus will always conquer. But the reality I want you to know is that there is hell. Say there is hell. Any man who doesn't preach hell does not believe that there is one. Do you believe there is hell? Maybe you believe, but I want you to take time to capture the agony of this burning hell. When a man dies, in Isaiah 14 verse 9, the Bible said, hell from beneath is moved to meet thee. So help, hell even comes to meet, to welcome you. When people die without Christ, hell just comes out to welcome them. Hallelujah. Because hell has a mouth. You know, hell has a mouth. Hell has a mouth. Hell has a belly. Hmm. The Bible said that hell has opened its mouth wide without measure. And their pomp and their glory. And he that rejoices shall descend into it. Hell. That's enlarged herself. That's opened her mouth without measure. Isaiah 5.14. Hell is real. See, hell is real. Hell from beneath. So hell is beneath. According to statistics, any time, just look at your watch. Any time your watch ticks, three people sink into Christless eternity. So any time your watch ticks, three people descend into Christless eternity. That means that 180 people die in every one minute and go to hell. That means that since I began speaking, a lot of people have, have gone to hell already. <laughs> because in every one minute, 180 people descend into hell. Hell from beneath. Hell is beneath. Hell is here. That is why, you know, we have, when we consider the divisions of the earth, we have the crust, the mantle, the core, the outer core, and the what? The inner core. <laughs> now, the crust is just 40 feet downward. But when you go beyond, you get to the mantle. At the bottom of the mantle, the, mantle, the temperature there measures. 4,000 degrees Fahrenheit. You only need 300 degrees Fahrenheit to bake cake in the oven. But at the bottom of the mantle, 4,000 degrees Fahrenheit. And when you, you see, hell is under the earth. And when you go downward to the core, that one is dangerous. The temperature, the temperature of the core it's actually 11,000 degrees Fahrenheit, more than the photosphere. The surface of the sun is just 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit. So the, the heat at the core is stronger than the surface of the sun. And you see, the more you go down, the more you get to hell. Look, just watch videos of people who have had death experiences. The moment you die, if you are the devil, they say the messenger of the devil is there to take you to your home your eternal abode, your eternal home. And hell is serious. It's fearful. Hell is just one compartment in Hades. You see, Hades is a very open place. It's, it's, it's a very big place. In Hades, we have, we have Tartarus or Tartaru, which is the place for fallen angels. Some of the fallen angels are there. We have another place we call Abusos, which is another abyss, which has also some of some demons are kept there. Then we have hell, the place of fire, unquenchable fire. That is when, when men, the rebels, go there. Don't worry if you don't know where hell is, because according to Isaiah 65, in the last days, we shall make an excursion to hell to see those who rebelled against God. The Bible says we shall go there. There will be an excursion. 
and we will see those. They are wallowing in the fires of hell. And the Bible says that their fire is not quenched, and their worm dieth not. And every sacrifice shall be salted with salt. Amazing. But you see, we have Tataru, we have Abyss, we have Hell. We have another place, that one, no one is there now. We call that place the Monhoro, basic discontinuity. That is where Satan will be released in, in Revelation 20 at the bottomless pit between the mantle and the crust. Everything spins this way. But hell is fierce. If, amazingly, if one goes to hell, hell is not eternal, but the lake of fire is eternal. The Bible uses the word Hades. Hades is Greek, but Sheol is Hebrew. Sheol is the same as Hades. Hades is the world of departed spirit. It's a very huge place. And in Hades, there are different departments and compartments. There is hell, there is Tartaru, there is Abusus, there are different. As I'm speaking, demons are now executing judgment over people in hell. Demons are now, I mean, it's not the final estate for the, the rebels. Hell is not their final place of punishment. Hell will be cast into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is eternal. That place is dangerous. The lake of fire. The Bible says that the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath. Of his wrath, which is poured down without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And they shall be tormented day and night before the presence of the Lamb and before the presence of the holy angels. Revelation 14 verse 10. That one is dangerous. Hell. Hallelujah. Hell. That's the greatest enemy is death. And a friend of death is Hades. Hades. Death and Hades. Death is the dustpan. Hades is the trash can. Death is the dustpan the devil uses to collect the human race, to cast it into the trash can. Hades, the lake of fire. As I'm speaking, people are dying. It's eternal. I pray that God will open your eyes to see the flames of fire. Some years ago, the Lord made me see hell, but not inside hell, but the outside of hell. And to hear the groans and people screaming and shouting. And I saw the inscription, the prison of the incorrigible. And people were crying. And the screams were so dangerous. <laughs> it was so fearful. That even if you were a believer, you may be thinking you are going there. <laughs> Hallelujah. But why am I saying all these things? Hell is a reality. Jesus now is back calling his people to preach the gospel. Because many are not seeing the reality of this place. Hell is a continuation. Those who serve the God of last, when they go there, they are going to serve last. Those who serve the God of music, when they go there, they are going to serve the God of music. It's a continuation. And there are degrees of punishment in hell. And the same as in heaven, we are not going to be the same. In hell, they are not going to be the same. <laughs> Jesus said, woe unto you, Pharisees, for ye compass sea and land to make one proselyte. And after he is made, ye make him twofold a child of Gehenna than yourself. So they are people who are too food, a child of Gehenna. It shall be more tolerable for Ty and for Sidon in the day of judgment than for this city. I bet that you see the reality. Hell, fire. And people are going there. Day and night, day and night, day and night. But the reason why many believers have no passion their hearts are dried. One man said, because our, the reason why our eyes are dried is because our hearts are dried. 
because the eyes are the outlet of the heart. The reason why there is no passion is because I have realized that many Christians have not been able to distinguish the differences between compassion and natural affection. Compassion and natural affection. You see, many saints have substituted compassion for what is called natural affection. Natural affection. Natural affection. You will see that many of you have natural affection. But what you have is not actually compassion. Because compassion has its own unique manifestation. Natural affection is the, the affection of the natural man. Compassion is of the spirit. Now, you know that there are two kinds of love. You know there is filio and there is what? Agapa, or what we call agape. You see? Natural affection is the issue of filial love. But compassion is the expression of the agape, the divine love. Human love will give birth to natural affection, but divine love will give birth to compassion. Praise God. Human love always births natural affection, for everyone has natural affection. But compassion is exceptional. That one comes from divine love. That's why in 2 Timothy 3, verse 1, Paul said, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, boosters, proud, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection. Paul mentions natural affection. In 2 Timothy 3, verse 2, there's natural affection. You see? Natural affection. John said, Whoso has this world good and shattered his bowels, whoso has this world good and seeth his brother hath need and shattered his bowels of compassion, how dwelleth the agapa of the love of how dwelleth the agapa, the divine love of God in him? Whoso has this world good, you have the goods of the world, and you see it, your brother have need, and you shattered the bowels of your compassion. How dwelleth the divine love of God in you? First John 3, 17. How dwelleth that love in you? So you see, compassion is the outflow of that divine love. But natural affection belongs to every human being. For example, let me show you. If we are all to make an excursion to Kolebu Hospital or to um, Konfanochi or to, we are going to the emergency ward of 37 military hospital. The instant we all reach there, everyone will have natural affection. Because you will see the injured, the one who is battered, tattered, bruised. You will see how they are, they are scattered, they are scorched. You, you will see their pain. And all of a sudden, you have natural affection. If you're in a car and you see an accident ahead of you and you see blood, everyone, those who are not born again and those who are born again, everyone will have natural affection. Why? Because it is natural. Is that not so? If we are here, we see someone just fall from the roof. <laughs> Tango, we are here. If he dies, we just raise him up. Amen. But if you see the person fall down, what will happen? You just have, there will be a movement within your bowels, the bowels of affection. You will have natural affection. Praise God. Let me ask you a question. Why is it that? When you go for missions in the villages, the moment you get there, you are moved. Something happens within you. Most of the times, let me define that movement that you have. You see the physical estate of the people, how they are poor. You see the kind of food they eat. If you see their physical condition, how they are deprived. When you see their state, all of a sudden, you feel like preaching the gospel to them. You feel like preaching to them. Why is it that you see people on campus who are well to do, but you are not moved to preach the gospel to them? What is the difference? Why? I mean, you see people smiling, people eating around, they are happy, coming for lectures. Nothing moves you to preach the gospel to them. But when you go to the village, you see their condition and you want to preach to them. Why? What, what moved you was the natural affection. You saw how hungry they are. Hey, they need something. You say, well, let me give them the gospel. But on campus, they are not hungry, but you don't want to preach to them. It means that you, most of the times we are led by natural affection. 
When we see them, yay! And the natural affliction will trigger something within us. Then we'll bring forth something to preach the gospel. But if it was to be, compassion goes beyond the physical needs of the people. Compassion sees their spiritual state, their wretchedness, and how miserable they are spiritually. Compassion obviously cares for their natural state, but it goes beyond the natural. If you have compassion, let me ask you a question. If you go to the football stadium, or if you see a stadium full of people, what comes into your heart first? Wow, the park will be jumping today. Park will be nice. The match will be nice. It's natural. When you see a lot of people coming, what happens to you? Wow. But see, compassion is unique. <laughs> Say unique. Compassion is unique. That's what Jude one twenty two said, and some have compassion, making a difference. And some, Jude one twenty two, and some have compassion, making a difference. The difference is in having compassion. Having compassion. It's not just because... So people are just content. Oh, these people are poor, let's go and supply them food. It's good to supply them food. But the real thing is that they need Jesus. They need to be saved. You see? If you have compassion, if I have to be in a parliament house and you see parliamentarians, with compassion you see their spiritual nakedness. It's not because they are rich and they have in abundance, but you see their desperate condition. Because compassion is that which satisfies the heart of God. So my prayer for you is that you go beyond natural affection and hold on to compassion. Hallelujah. And some have compassion, making a difference. And some save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating the garment, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. 23 of Jude 1. The Bible said if you have compassion, two things come, fear and hate. <laughs> compassion will stir you up. You have a certain kind of amazement, all. Oh, that you want to save people and pull them out of the fire. You pull them out of the fire. And some have compassion. Compassion is that, is that which causes you to pull people out of the fire. Pulling them out of the fire. Hating even the garment spotted on the flesh. Pull them out of the fire. Say, I'll pull them from the fire. Pulling them out of the fire. Who are the people we have to pull them from? The, which fire? The fire is the fire of God's judgment. Zechariah said, and I saw Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand to resist him. And the Lord said unto Satan, the Lord rebuke thee. Even the Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke thee. Is not this a brand plucked out of the fire? Is not this a brand plucked out of the fire? Zechariah 3 verse 1 and 2. Is not this a brand plucked out of the fire? Joshua the high priest was in a filthy garment and the devil was about to resist him. And the Lord rebuked Satan. Is not this a brand plucked out of the fire? Every man who has compassion will have something at work in him. The word is planchinizomai. It's an agitation, a movement from the, from the visceral part. Something within will stir you up if you see your neighbor. He may have all things, but without Christ, something will move you. And you will fear. That kind of fear will cause you to pull him out of the fire. Praise God. As I'm speaking, I see you speaking to your next door neighbor. Pulling him or her out of the fire. Your roommate pulling him or her out of the fire. The fire of God's judgment. Hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. There are some believers, they have drawn back. We are not of them that draw back unto perdition, but we are of them that believe unto the saving of the soul. There are those who have drawn back. And there are those, though they have been clothed with a garment of righteousness, yet it is dirty. 
But we have to bring them back so that they will wash their robes in the blood of the lamb that they may have right to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Hallelujah. After the fire of God's judgment, unbelievers will bend, but believers who are not working with God will also face that fire. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit said to the churches. Him that overcometh shall not be heads of the second death. Revelation 2 11. Him that overcometh shall not be heads of the second death. Remember 1 Corinthians 3 15 that they shall be seed, yet so as by fire. There are some people who will be seed, yet so as by fire. They are in the faith. So when we go to evangelize, there are some people, although they are in the faith, we must still pull them out of the fire because they are in some kind of judgment. Hallelujah. See, I'll make a difference. And some make a difference. Compassion. I doubt if you... Compassion. The love of God is within your heart, but I doubt if you have, them, you have allowed compassion to take absolute control over your consciousness. Because with compassion, we will see the fruit and the manifestation. You can't have compassion and just be sitting anyhow. Compassion will steer you on your feet. Compassion will not cause your tongue to cleave to the roof of your mouth. Compassion will burst your mouth open. Even when you are unprepared, even before premeditation, you'll find yourself preaching the gospel. It is compassion that breaks the limitations of fear. Why? When a man is in compassion, his love is greater than his fear. He has to preach to his next door neighbor, but fear grips you on your track. Fear causes you to be like a dumb man, though you can speak very well. Fear keeps you frozen on your track, but when compassion is alive, you begin to sound with the voice of the trumpet. You begin to speak on the top of the mountains, and when you meet a woman at a circus well, you begin to expound the glory of God in vivid description. And some have compassion. And when he saw the multitude, he was moved with compassion on them. Because they fainted and they were scattered. As sheep having no shepherd. Matthew 9 36. Oh, when Jesus saw the multitude, when you see people, what moves you on the inside? When he saw, he was moved with compassion on them. Why? Because they fainted. Not because they were physically fainting, but he saw that they were fainting by the load of some, the burdensome load of sin. The burdensome load of sin was over them. And it was upon them so much that they were fainting. And they scattered. Why? As sheep. Having no shepherd. Jesus is a good shepherd. They were scattered as sheep. That's the, the miserable condition of men because men are sheep. Number one, sheep cannot dwell alone. Sheep must move. They must move as a flock. And number two, a sheep without a fold is very disastrous. The sheep must be in the fold. But if a sheep is scattered, that means the sheep is deprived of the fold. The sheep is exposed to bad weather conditions. Bad weather conditions. The sheep has no staff and has no rod and has no staff, the brook or the crook for his direction and for his comfort. The sheep is just moving anyhow. Jesus saw the sheep. He saw them as sheep and he was moved with compassion on them. The harvest is truly plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye the Lord of the harvest that, that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. A time has come when you see men. What is the first evidence? What is the first witness in your heart when you see people? It is that whether they are in Christ or they are not in Christ, that must be the movement of our heart. Are they in Christ? It is not that they are nice and they have a good... Beyond everything, the most important question is this, whether they are in Christ or they are not in Christ. 
Hallelujah. Because the lost are poor and the poor are lost. Look at Jesus. In John 10, 11, he said, I am the good shepherd, and the good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. In John 10, 11, he is a good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. He's a good shepherd. And as a good shepherd, he saw that the sheep were without shepherd. They didn't have him. But let me show you how do we demonstrate the love of God to the world. How do we demonstrate the love of God to the world? Number one, by the incarnational method. The incarnational method. The incarnational method. The incarnational method. What is the incarnational method? Jesus is the great shepherd. Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Who is the shepherd? The Lord. Jesus, he's Jehovah Rohai, or Jehovah Rohi, he's the good shepherd, the bread provider, the caretaker. Once he's the shepherd, you will not want. The psalmist said, give ye, O shepherd of Israel, thou that leadest Joseph like a flock, thou that dwellest between the cherubims, shine forth. Psalm 80 verse 1. He is called a shepherd of Israel. He's a shepherd. Give ye. The Lord is a good shepherd. Praise God. I look at something. What is the incarnation method? He said the good shepherd is the one that gives his life for the sheep. How did he give his life for the sheep? The shepherd is a man, but a sheep is an animal. They have two different natures. Two different natures. A shepherd is a man who cares for the sheep. But Jesus is a great shepherd, the good shepherd. And how did he give his life for the sheep? He didn't give his life for the sheep as a great shepherd or the good shepherd. What did he do? The good shepherd became a sheep to die for the sheep. The good shepherd actually became a sheep. Now the Bible said, all we like sheep, Isaiah 53, verse 6, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. All we like sheep, we are all like sheep. All we like sheep have gone astray. So we are the sheep. But Jesus is the shepherd. But verse 7 said, he was oppressed and he was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before his shearers is dumb. So he openeth not his mouth. He's, we are the sheep, yet he was brought as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep. So he, he stood before Pilate as a sheep, before his cherish, those who killed him. So the great shepherd in the incarnational method, incarnation means, though he was a great shepherd, yet he stripped himself of his Shepherdorial honors and became a sheep. What am I trying to say? Incarnation, incarnational method. How we can win the lost? Incarnation. Incarnation. God is a transcended God. Say the transcended God. God is transcendent, yet the transcended God condescended. God, who alone has immortality. Dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto, whom no man can see, to whom be honor and power everlasting. First Timothy 6 16. God, He has immortality. Look at how God is transcendent. Job said, Canst thou by searching find out the Almighty unto perfection? Yea, it is higher than heaven. What canst thou do? It is deeper than hell. What canst thou know? Job 11, 7 and 8. You can't find him unto perfection. The Bible says that God is great and we know him not. Neither the number of his years can we search him out. 
Great things do what he which we cannot comprehend. God is mighty. He is the transcendent God. He is above all. He fills the universe. Look at how great God is. God cannot be kept in the earth. He is greater than the earth. He is a transcendent God. The book of Habakkuk said, chapter 3 said, God came down from Teman, the Holy One from Mount Paran. His glory covered the heavens and the earth was full of his praise. Hmm. The Bible said, for before him went forth the pestilence and there were burning coals beneath his feet. He stood and measures the earth. The perpetual hills did bow and the everlasting mountains were scattered. <laughs> I saw the tent of cushion in affliction and the curtains of the land of Midian did tremble. When God comes to town, the Bible said, The Lord God is he that touched the mountains and they shall melt. When he appeared in Exodus at the Mount Sinai, the Bible said, In his appearance, his feet was like the paved work of sapphire stone. Paved work of sapphire stone. He is unique. He is great. He fills the universe. Yet this transcended God. How can he know God? God is inconceivable. You can't conceive God. Only God can conceive God. Even if you can conceive God, even if you can, see, you can conceive God, God is ineffable. After conceiving God, you can't even express God. And even if you can express God, God is incomprehensible. After your exp expression of him, he can't be understood. God is great. God is great. Yet, this almighty God transcended, transcendent, condescended. That, condesc that condescension, the condescension of God is that incarnational method. The reason for the incarnation and for his condescension was for the purpose of death, that he might die. Who being in the form of God thought it's not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant. He condescended. Hallelujah. So God stripped himself of glory. He stripped himself of glory and entered into the realm of humanity. Condescended. That is a principle he has laid down for us in reaching the world, incarnational method. Look at Paul the apostle. Paul was a great man. He called himself the Hebrew and Hebrew of Hebrews, Pharisee of Pharisees. Paul was raised according to three elements of Western culture. When we look at Paul, Paul was trained according to the Jewish religion. Yet he was raised by the Greek culture. Yet he lived in those days in the Roman Empire. He lived in the jurisdiction. He lived in a Roman, according to Roman politics, in the Roman Empire. So Paul was a Roman. We had three, Paul had three qualifications. He was under the Roman politics because he was a Roman. Paul was the Hebrew of Hebrews. So he had the Hebrew culture or the Hebrew religion. But he had the Hellenistic Greek culture. Paul was a learned man, trained under Gamaliel, had great authority. Yet, what things was gained to him, he counted loss. Paul, this great man, knew about the incarnational method and knew how to reach to the world and knew how to love one another. He knew what the gospel was and he, he knew the value of the immortal soul and he knew how to repudiate all and abnegate all and to go all out for a single soul. Praise God. So Paul, he said, though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of. A necessity is laid upon me. Woe unto me if I preach not the gospel. Woe unto me if I preach not the gospel. For if I do this thing willingly, I have a reward. But if against my will, a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me. What is my reward then? Verily, yea, that if I preach the gospel, I make the gospel without charge. And then Paul said, Though I be free from all men, yet 
I have become the servant of all, that I might by all means save some. He said to the Jew, became I as a Jew, that I might win the Jews. To the Gentile, became I as a Gentile, that I might win them. To them that are under the law, I became as one under the law, that I might win them. And to them that are without the law, became I as one that is without the law, not being without the law unto God, but under the law of Christ, that I may win them that are without the law. To the weak became I as weak, that I may gain the weak. I am become all things to all men, that I might by all means win some. The first Corinthians 9, 17 to 22. I might by all means win some. This is what is called the incarnational method. Paul said to the Jew, I became, I became a Jew. That means Paul wasn't a Jew. So when you are in Christ, you are not, no longer an Asante. You are no longer a Fante. Because Paul was a Jew. He said to the Jew, became I as a Jew. Hallelujah. I became as a Jew. That, that's the incarnational method. Paul had that ability. When I meet a Jew, I'm, a, I'm as a Jew. When I meet a Gentile, I become as a Gentile. When I meet a Greek, as a Greek. A barbarian, as a barbarian. A Scythian, as a Scythian. Whoever I meet, I become that person. To win that person. This is what is called the incarnational method. Hallelujah. Amen. Say incarnation. Amen. Incarnational method. Now, the reason for the incarnation of Christ is to die, is to give his life. So the Bible says that hereby perceive we, perceive we, hereby perceive we the love of God. That if he laid down his life for us, we ought also to lay down our lives for one another. Hereby perceive we the love of God. 1 John 3, 16. This is how we can perceive the love of God. That if the man laid down his life in, in incarnation for one another, we ought also to lay down our life for one another. Praise God. The only way to express, to show the love to the world is to lay our lives for them. To lay down our lives for them. You see, Jesus Christ laid down his life for the sake of redemption. We don't lay our lives down for redemption. We, did, we laid down our lives to reveal the love life that men might see the love to be attracted and magnetized to Jesus Christ. Praise God. Love. Our gladly spend and be spent upon a service and a sacrifice of your faith. 2 Corinthians 12, 15. I will gladly spend and be spent. Paul said, I will gladly spend and be spent. Paul said, I protest. I protest by your rejoicing, which I have in Christ Jesus. I die daily. I die daily. He said, in death often. You see, this is the principle of resurrection. The principle of resurrection is this, that life comes out of death. You must lay down your lives that men may see. How do I mean? For example, this are in minute letter matters. For example, you are in your room. You have a roommate who is an unbeliever. You're all going for lectures, and your roommate needs a pen, and you have a pen. Let me show you how you can lay your life down. You give your pen to the person, though you are going for the same lecture. Give your pen away to him or her, and just go. Praise God. That's a great act. You may think it's letter. It will shock you how great it will appear in heaven. And by this, you have sown the seed of love. You have sown it. It's a seed. Someone needs money, your next door neighbor. You know you have your last 100 Ghana CD on your account. Your last 100 Ghana CD in your account. What do you do? Oh, this one. And you begin to say, oh, if I give it to him, I have. The Bible said, I love your neighbor as yourself. If I give it to him, I have loved my neighbor more than myself. But I understood in John 15, 13, greater love has no man than this, that a man will lay down his life for his friend. It is in laying down our lives that decorates the, or gives fragrance to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Paul said, for the love of Christ constraineth me, 
Because we thus judge that if one died, then we're all dead. 2 Corinthians 5.14, if one died, we are all dead. So as I'm speaking to you, we're a dead man, though you are alive. So you must lay down your life for one another. If men will see that element, they'll be born again. So we are talking about demonstration of love. Demonstration has to do with act, not only proclamation, but it's affirm- affirmation plus proclamation. You are not just speaking, but you, you are showing forth. Your love is not in word, it is in deed. Praise God. That means that you, you are full of joy. You, your whole body, your whole appearance is gospel. You can't say you are demonstrating the love of God if you wake up in the morning and you are not smiling and your face is frowned and squeezed. You are not preaching the gospel with your face. As far as I know, you must preach the gospel with your face, with your teeth, with your lips, with your eyebrow, with your legs, with everything must preach the gospel. Because your body does not belong to you. You have been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God with your body and your spirit, which are the laws. Hallelujah. You, you can show love. Demonstrating the love of God. And if, if compassion grows, malondo sofotoro mundo. For I could wish that myself were a case for my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh. Romans 9, 1 and 2. Paul, he wished he could go to hell for the sake of his brothers. Paul wished he could go to hell for the sake of the Jews. And in the same prayer, Moses prayed in Exodus 32, 32. 32. <laughs> That if you not forgive them, I pray they bloat my name out of the book which thou has written. Moses was willing to go to hell for the sake of the Israelites. Paul was willing to go to hell for the sake of the Jews. What are you willing to do? What are you willing to do? You are not even willing to sacrifice your evening supper for the sake of your friend who is hungry. If you are led by the Spirit, you can have a lot of schemes and methods to win souls. You have to be a soul winner. For instance, if you meet someone who is an athlete, who is a sportsman. He doesn't start talking about economics. All he knows is about sports, international method. You should be sport-minded. The moment you get there, just, even if you don't know anything about sports, just be, start asking about that. Just get yourself in that conversation. And when the person gets to know that, oh, you are concerned about what he's doing, with all wisdom, you put in a good chip in the gospel. When you meet a businessman, start talking about business. This is the incarnational method. Oh, business. And go into the business and go into commerce and start talking. And you talk and talk and talk and you have, you have a way of introducing the gospel there. If you meet an architect, what do you do? Start talking about architecture. <laughs> and after you have spoken, you have to reveal that Jesus is the perfect architect. Jesus is the cornerstone, the chief cornerstone, the headstone, the top stone, and the capstone. Anybody at all you meet, don't just, you need skill to present the gospel. There are times you have to really, there are, there are special times you have to frighten the person. There are a few cases like that. When a person, <laughs> the, the Lord will lead you. If you don't, <laughs> <laughs> there are some, Paul said, knowing the terror of the Lord will persuade men. There are times like that. But most of the times, you have to have a way of persuading a person, necessi- necessitating how to convince the person. You have to use all wisdom. Wisdom. He that winneth soul is wise. It takes wisdom to win soul, a soul. Wisdom. You can invite a person for a dinner. But make sure the person doesn't convert you. And you have to be wise. You are a lady and you invite a guy 11 p.m. You were alone to, to preach to the guy. You shouldn't do that. Jesus met Nicodemus at night, but he met the woman, the Samaritan woman at 12 o'clock.
Don't get worried if the first conversation, the person doesn't give in. Don't get worried. The thing is that you have to be praying for the person secretly. On your knee. On your knee. And of course, the messages I teach you about household salvation. You must be praying. And just get along with the person. And know how to introduce the gospel little by little. Everyone in the, in the style, commit a person to God and believe God for the person. There are many people around you, they go for lecture and they are complaining, every day complaining. But if you will stop complaining and be distinguished, not that you are not harassed, you may be harassed, but when men are complaining and people are Shut this person, you begin to smile and walk. Oh yeah, 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 but you make a difference with your companion, you make a difference. Do all things without murmuring and disputing that you may be harmless and blameless, you see. The sons of God, among whom ye shine as light in the midst of a crooked and a depraved generation. So in this generation that is twisted and perversed, when people are complaining and murmuring and speaking, if you join them, you extinguish your light. Anytime you murmur and complain, you don't shine. You participate in darkness. That's why I say, do all things without murmuring and disputing, that ye may be harmless and blameless, so that you will shine as light. You become spiritual luminaries, radiating forth the glories of God, His light. So don't complain. When men are complaining about Ghana government, they make talk. Ah. I remember a time people were complaining, oh, this Kufo came and did this, and this person came and did this, and everyone came, and it, they, they, everyone came and there was, there was a fault. And I was happy to be in the midst of them. I introduced to them a kingdom that never fails because <laughs> all human kingdoms are faulty. <laughs> That's why you don't have to depend on men. There's a way to bring the conversation out. By that, you will win them. Hallelujah. Your simple act of love, your love life, the little things you do, you can give a coin to someone, you can buy water for someone, you can do something little. And to be a great inspiration for someone. Lift up your right hand and begin to pray. Thank you, Jesus. You want to pray that God will show you means and show you lights and ways and methods. Stir up passion and compassion to see hell, to see the flames of hell, to see. The yawning mouth of hell, the seductive fires of hell, the lake that burneth with sulfur and brimstone, the same sad drink of the wine. Of the wrath which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation and they shall be tormented day and night before the presence of the Lamb and before the holy angels for God so loved the world that he gave his holy begotten son that whosoever believeth on him should not perish but have everlasting life for God did not send his son to condemn the world but the world through him might be saved but this is the condemnation the light has come into the world but men love darkness rather than light and hereby perceive we the love of God that he laid down his life for us we ought also to lay down our lives for one another we ought to lay down our lives for one another our lives for one another greater love has no man than this that a man will lay down his life for his friend will give his life for his friend this is greater love this is agape undefeatable benevolence benevolence that cannot be defeated unconquerable goodwill that seeks the highest good of others no matter what they have done the Bible said mind not high things condescend to men of low estates 
it is time to condescend condescend to men of low estate mind not high things but condescend to men of low estate and be not wise in your own conceit condescend to men condescension condescension we break classism and we break every barrier and we reach out to people no matter who they are no matter who they are and when he saw the multitude he was moved with compassion on them because they were fainted and they were scattered as sheep having no shepherd I see the passion for souls sweeping your heart one more time I see someone catching the flames of eternal fires glory to Jesus thank you Jesus thank you Jesus thank you Jesus Lord that we may see give us the eyes to see the eyes to see the seed for passion the passion for souls Gavele Gadagaradada Feredes Zulo Kovorondo Papakande Kavatende Vere Kavazunde Thank you Jesus Kabarata Sata Geredes Vevegaderedes Zarata and some save with fear pulling them out of the fire hitting even the garment that is spotted by the flesh and some have compassion making a difference making a difference this know also in the last days perilous times shall come men shall be lovers of themselves hey covetous boastful proud disobedient to parents unthankful unholy without natural affection we go beyond the borders of natural affection we stand between within the borders of compassion compassion the force of the spirit the agitation of the spirit the yearnings of the spirit for if there be any cons con consolation in christ if there be any comfort of love if there be any bowels of mercy if there be any fellowship of the spirit bowels of mercy bowels 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 of mercy thank you jesus and i'll sing the last song as we close one and the last song Is your charge this charge I commit unto you Saint Timothy I give thee this charge before God and the Lord Jesus who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and kingdom preach the word be instant in season out of season Rebuke, reproof with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they shall not endure some doctrine. This charge I give you. I give you this charge.
without any instrument, can we lift our hands on high? I have sing from your spirit. Hey God, to glory. That is your earthly charge. Engage. 